Well, good morning, class. I'm going to have a little bit of a different lecture this time. I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about uh, the second coming. The book of First Thessalonians has a major section, about a chapter and a half, on the second coming. Uh, second Thessalonians, that's the major topic of the book. Uh, second Timothy. We'll have in chapter 3, that is a major topic of chapter 3, as well as a topic of chapter 4. And uh, I'd like to organize it just a little bit more systematically, give you a little bit of a doctrinal study as well. So when we're talking about the end times, uh, let me first of all start and uh, say that there are different theories about the millennium. Now the millennium is the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. Post-millennial position believes that the church is going to advance, it's going to convert the world, and there will be a very long period of time, which the Bible describes as a 1,000 years, or that concept in which Christ will reign in the hearts of people and will create a very paradise on earth. Now, that's a very positive view that the church is going to convert the world. The amillennial position, or the amillennial, simply says there is no thousand years. At the end of time, Christ will simply come back, gather together his elect, Take the wicked and bring him to judgment. And uh, he will not reign at all on this earth for a thousand years. The premillennial position uh, holds that uh, at the end of a period of tribulation, and things will get worse and worse until the Antichrist comes, you'll have the tribulation, and Jesus Christ will then come back to earth with the saints which have been raptured, and he will rule on this earth with the saints, for 1,000 years. Now, that is the predominant belief in modern evangelical circles is the pre-millennial position. We're anticipating the rise of the Antichrist, the rapture, a period of tribulation. People may have different ideas when the rapture is going to occur in the tribulation. All of that's still part of the pre-millennial idea. And then at the end of the millennium, Christ is going to come back and will reign. However, historically, the position that was probably taken more often was the post-millennial position, that the church would win the world. That would have been the predominant position of the Methodist church. And uh, premillennialism overtook uh, holiness people until predominantly today, most of us are holiness people. However, there's a rising number of post-millennialists. Um, in our circles. And uh, certainly, I hold the premillennial side. That's what I'm going to be teaching. But um, that's perfectly fine if they disagree. Let me explain a few key reasons why I feel like the rapture must happen within a few years. And I think the real big issue we need to look at is right here not trying to take a few passages here or there about the millennium, but let's look at the second coming. What does the Bible say about Jesus Christ's second coming? Now, I am convinced that we are living in the age in which Jesus Christ will come back. It will be during our normal lifetime. So, it'll happen within a few years. I am not going to try to predict when, what year, what day? No man knoweth the day or the hour. But we do have an idea. We're not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. Now, there are some signs that seem to be sort of beginning things, such as war on a greater scale, Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, uh, famines, plagues, and earthquakes. Now, the Bible says that these are the beginning of sorrows. 
but the end is not yet. All of those things have happened down throughout history. And while we may look and say World War II was a greater war than we've ever had before, we may look and say we're having more earthquakes than we've had before, we may look at a pestilence, a disease, or an epidemic that is spreading across the country or the world, or a pandemic, and we say, this, this is a sign of the end. They've all happened before in history. And yes, at the last times, they're going to be there on a greater scale, perhaps, but it's hard to really say for sure that those are the last day signs that are clear cut. But I want to give you eight things that have never happened before that have happened in our day. And that is the reason I am convinced that it is our day. First of all, the rebirth of the nation of Israel. In May 1948, Israel became a nation. It was immediately pounced on by the Arab countries, and the power of God delivered that country. That is the fulfillment of prophecy. Over in Matthew 24, it talked about that uh, when the fig tree buds, you know that the end is near, even at the door. For verily I say unto you, that generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, what do we mean by that generation? It's all these things, but that generation, it could be 40 years. That's why some people predicted 1988. Well, obviously they weren't right. A generation can be 70 years, the lifetime of a person. And uh, 70 years, that would bring us to 1918. Obviously, that date didn't work. Some have suggested it wasn't just the birth of the nation of Israel, that it was the recapture of Jerusalem in the, in the Six-Day War in 1967. And they would try to say 40 years from there or 70 years from there. But uh, I will say this. The other way you can understand a generation, it says that generation shall not pass, is that some of people that were alive when these things happened, some of those will still be alive when God says it is finished and he ends everything and comes back to rule on this earth. So the rebirth of the nation of Israel. No nation in history has ever been scattered across the globe for 2,000 years and then been reborn back in their own country. But it's happened exactly as God has predicted what happened in the last days. Never happened before, but it's happened today. Second thing I'd like to notice is the rise of nuclear weapons. Now, I am not trying to be disrespectful when I say it this way. I think it's just a clear-cut way of saying it. But we don't need God anymore to have the Great Tribulation. We don't have to wait for God to pour out his wrath anymore. We can produce our own. Nuclear weapons. There's never been a weapon developed in history that has not been used. You have uh, in Ezekiel 39 verse 6, it talks about fire falling on Magog and on them who dwell carelessly in the isles. Magog is uh, normally considered the country of Russia. That's where the descendants of, of Noah and his grandson Magog, that's where they settled. So that country will be destroyed. And of course, Russia has massive nuclear arsenal. One of the places destroyed, an unnamed place, away from everything else, and he identified it as the Isles. And uh, I think the most likely explanation is that the other place is the United States, uh, especially our major cities. But um, nevertheless, fire falls on those places. They're never heard of again in the tribulation, either one of them. Revelation 18, verses 8 through 10. It talks about that great city that had made all of the world rich by the abundance of her delicacies. It fits. 
some places like New York City, the United States. It said in one hour, she is destroyed. It's a place that ships go to. It says the smoke of her torment goes up. And people are afraid to go into the city because they're afraid of what happened to what happened to them, just like radiation would be. It fits a nuclear exchange. So, we will have a great tribulation like this world has never known because of the weapons that we have developed. Now, I'm also convinced that God is going to allow it to happen. And the only thing keeping it from happening today is God's restraining power. Over in 2 Thessalonians it says, He who now letteth. He who has the power to say, let it happen or don't let it happen. He'll let it happen. And we will see those things. It's never happened before. We've had massive wars. We've had massive destruction. Nothing compared to the capabilities of today. A third reason. Over in Revelation chapter 11 verse 9. We have two witnesses. These two witnesses. Are going to testify. For Jesus Christ, in the middle of the kingdom of the Antichrist, they're going to be a thorn in his side. Eventually, he's going to slay them. Their bodies are going to lie there in the city of Jerusalem for three days. And it said, people of every tongue and kindred and tribe and nation shall see their dead bodies and shall send gifts one to another. In other words, they have Christmas. They celebrate these people that have called down curses from God on us are dead. And they rejoice. But the Bible says that in those three days, the whole world sees their dead bodies. You know, you say, well, what big deal is that? It couldn't have happened until the rise of television. It would have been impossible. Three days? You could have got 50 miles with the news. They couldn't have even taken pictures. This is modern technology. It could not have happened. That prophecy could not have been fulfilled. But today, we don't even need the television. Somebody will pick up their cell phone. They'll take a picture of it and send it across the globe. And within a few moments of it happening, the whole world will know exactly what happened. And it will be out there, and the whole world will know all about it. Well, that, once again, has never happened before. That prophecy could not have been fulfilled. The fourth thing I'll notice is computer power and the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, verse 7 says, No man can buy or sell, except they have the mark. Now, this possibly could have been fulfilled by means of a tattoo in previous years. I understand that. But, in our day, when there's talk about a little computer chip being placed in the back of the hand, in the forehead, to identify people, that is something that has never happened before. Instead of putting that little computer chip on your credit card, they'll put it in the back of the hand. You'll just scan it across the scanner. It'll deduct the money from your account, put it in the store's account. Without that, you cannot buy or sell unless you have taken the mark of the beast. My brother-in-law lives in Wyoming. They were out hunting in the mountains of Wyoming and they came across a dog, somebody's hunting dog that had become lost. And of course, that dog was very excited to see them, to see any human being in that area, I think. Uh, he was starving, he was scrawny, and uh, they took him home. And then they took him over to the local veterinarian, and 
They said, we found this dog. How do we locate the owner? The veterinarian reached down under the dog's cheek and began to feel around. And he said, yep, he's got one of them. Grabbed his scanner, scanned it over his neck, printed it off, handed something to my brother-in-law, and he said, here's the name and the address of the owner of that dog. They called him up. He lived 300 miles away across the state. He said, yeah, that's my dog. He said, I lost him while hunting. Well, we've got your dog. Come and get him. You know, if a dog's that valuable, what do you think about a baby? A person. You know, if you don't want the bank keeping track of your money, what do you have to hide? You know, we Christians will be facing a lot of pressure, a lot of persecution, if we refuse to take the mark of the beast. Over in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 4, the fifth one is this. It says, men, the last times, the days of the end, men shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. There's two of them there, but men running to and fro. If in 1848, you had gathered with a number of others in the city of Independence, Missouri, headed down the Oregon Trail to the wonderful land out west that you had heard about. You would gather there and in the early spring, and just as soon as the grass was up, you head on your trek. Five, six, seven months to travel the probably around 2,000 miles to the Oregon country. Hard, grueling trip, trek, but you only averaged about two miles an hour. A lot of people walked behind the wagons the entire distance, saving the oxen. Now, you can imagine that trip. Pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. You had to cross the mountains before the snows stopped you to get down into the Willamette Valley into Oregon, if you made it. The Donner Party going to California didn't make it, got caught by the snows, and many of them died. Well, how many of you, you know, traveled at that pace to get here? Well, we don't go slow. You know, if Adam had gotten in one of those horses that God had created back in the Garden of Eden, how fast could he have ridden for maybe a couple of three miles? I think maybe a horse can go 40 miles an hour, a racehorse. Can't keep it up very long. If you had come across almost 6,000 years to Henry Ford's Model T in 1900 or 1906, and you got in that Model T, one of his early vehicles, and you revved the motor up and wound it out and could find a nice smooth stretch of road, how fast could you go? Maybe about the same. Probably a, maybe a slight bit faster. How many of you traveled to school at 40 miles an hour? You know, if you did, you probably had people screaming at you and say, Hey, Grandpa, get off the road. I can say that because I'm old. I do go for more than 40, though. Well, men shall run to and fro. It's very possible for a person, a businessman, to have a meeting in Chicago on Monday. And so early Monday morning, he gets up from New York City. He flies to Chicago for that meeting. On to L.A. for a Tuesday meeting. To Seattle for Wednesday. Back to New Orleans for Thursday. 
and flies back into New York on Friday for the weekend. And thus his weeks are like that week after week. Men shall run to and fro, and now it's no longer just that. It's they fly to Buenos Aires, down in South America, and across to Johannesburg, South Africa, and around to Hong Kong, and Sydney, Australia, and then back home for the weekend. Well, probably not every week like, quite like that, but it's unbelievable. A person can get on a commercial airline in New York City and eat breakfast at the normal time for breakfast before he gets on. He can get in the airplane and about five hours later they can land in Los Angeles, California and he can eat lunch at the normal time you would eat lunch. Um, actually, it would be before lunch for them. He can then get in the airplane and fly to Honolulu, Hawaii and eat supper at the normal time. Men running to and fro. 200 years ago, 300 years ago, the average person in Europe never traveled more than 50 miles in their entire life. If they did, it was a one trip of a lifetime. A pilgrimage probably to some holy site. Most of the time they never traveled further than the major city in any given year. Maybe to a fair or just a little bit further, but that was it. Today, our traveling is unbelievable. But Daniel prophesied that. It has never, never happened before like this in history. The sixth thing that has never happened before like this is it says knowledge shall increase. Well, you say, haven't people really been gaining knowledge all the way down throughout history? Well, we had a big gap during the entire Middle Ages, and when things began to open up with the scientific revolution, um, we went back and began to study the ancient Greeks, and that's, what we, that's where the wisdom was. We've gradually gained knowledge in the last 300 years. But something has strangely happened in recent years. There has been an unbelievable explosion of knowledge. I read in a book that the amount of material we knew was doubling every 20 years. And then I read it was now doubling every 10 years, then every 5 years, and every 2 years, and every 6 months. Now all the knowledge they're getting is not equal, but it is unbelievable the amount of knowledge that we have. In fact, recorded by the cell phone company, is everywhere you went this last month, they can keep track of everybody there is. China uses cell phones today to keep track of over one, over a billion people in their populace. They know where they are. Well, knowledge shall increase. It's literally going almost straight up in what we know. In fact, one of the terms for our age is the information age. Now, all scientific knowledge 300 to 400 years ago could be memorized by one individual. As it began to expand, Diderot said, I'm going to make a set of books called the Encyclopedia and everything we know scientifically shall be put in those books. Today, absolute impossibility. Well, knowledge shall increase. It's never happened like this. Never. First time in history we've ever seen this. The seventh sign is church apostasy. It says that in the last days that the love of many should wax cold. It talks about a great falling away. It talks about the Laodicean church being lukewarm. We have seen a backsliding of the church like has never happened before in history, ever. I could look at the holiness movement 
the people who believe in old-fashioned standards, that believe in the doctrine of holiness, are only about a 10% of what the number we were. That's in the United States of America 50 years ago. We've lost 90% in 50 years. Baptists have done no better. Pentecostals have done no better. Europe is far worse than the United States. Europe, the cornerstone of Western civilization, the cornerstone of Christianity, England where our heritage lies, those places have a majority of people who no longer even believe in the existence of God. That has never happened like that in history, but it has happened in our day. We have seen the greatest apostasy that has ever happened in the church in this day. And the eighth and the last one, it says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I know there is a major argument about the unreached people groups, but there is an effort today to reach every man, woman, and child with the message of the gospel. It says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all nations. Every single nation on the face of this earth today has a nucleus of Christians that live in that country. Now, it's really referring to people groups rather than nations. But it doesn't use the more narrow terminology, kindred and tongue and tribe. But every ethnic group, someone in that ethnic group, before the end comes, will have heard the message of the gospel. It may have been through radio. It could be through internet. It could be through somebody leaving that ethnic group and going to the city. It could be from the gospel message in just any kind of a form there was in any way. But this gospel, this is the first generation in world history that could ever argue that the gospel has gone everywhere into this world. If we haven't finished it yet, we are working hard to finish the job. And then, it even talks about, in the book of Revelation, how the angels will preach to every tongue and kindred and tribe and nation. So, what do I think? I think this is the last days. I've given you eight things that have never happened before in history. Never. And that is why I believe it is this day. We're going to stop at this point, and I will come back and I will give you a lecture on some of the other aspects of the second coming, and uh, have a nice day. God bless you.